I trust you're having a great day. Even if your day perhaps has been busy, but I do trust you are having a great day. If you're here on the Zoom platform, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, TCV, FM, Christian Radio, we just want to welcome us all to FSM Daily Digital Show. Very, very glad that you're here with us this evening. We're starting a new theme. Our new theme is the preaching of the gospel. The preaching of the gospel. And our theme is Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. And verse 14 in summary says, And when this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, then Jesus will come. The preaching of the gospel, the content of this gospel is that Jesus is creator, redeemer, sustainer, and that he's coming back as king of the entire universe, Lord of the entire universe, and is worthy of all of our praises because he is God. I've learned recently that Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. And that being said, he can identify with us from a human perspective. But he also can intercede on behalf of us from a divine perspective. And this makes Jesus so unique to the human race. So uniquely positioned to be our Lord and our Savior. And so again, we just want to welcome us all. If you join us on the continent, from the continent of Africa, Australia, Asia, Europe, South and North America, where we're broadcasting from, we just want to welcome us all. We are blessed today to have as our 100 guests, my friend and my colleague in ministry, Dr. Lawrenson. I'm looking forward to hearing what Dr. Lawrenson will share with us this very day. So far, he has been sharing with us the parallelism, if you know, between the books of the Bible. He started from Genesis and working his way through Exodus, Number, etc. And he's showing us how all of these other books intersect with Revelation. It connects with Revelation in one way or the other. Revelation is a concluding book. And he has really opened my eyes to see Scripture in respect to the Revelation from this new perspective. In fact, he, Dr. Lawrence is the first person that I, have, I really demonstrate in such a clear manner with precise detail analysis how the various books of the Bible intersect or connect directly to the book of Revelation. And so if you're here today, I just want to let you know that you're in for a treat. You're in for an awesome show. As it is our custom, we strive on a daily basis to have a show that is Christ-centered, Bible-based, and relevant to our life as we live here on planet Earth the last days of this earth history. And I can say the you know, last days of this earth history because when you look at so many things that are going on in society, in our families, even in our personal lives, and when you see what's going on all around us, you and I have to conclude it. We have to conclude it upon the abundant evidence that we're living in the last days of this earth history. So I'm looking forward to hear uh, what Dr. Lawrenson would share f with us this very day. But I ask you just to bow your head with me as it's a part of our custom that we ask God the Holy Spirit uh, to direct our thoughts, our words, and our deed so we can glorify him and words, he, put, he could put words on our lips that will encourage each other in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good God of heaven, we just want to praise you because you're worthy. When we look at the writing of the book of Psalms, when David come to the last few Psalms in the book of Psalms, from, he focuses his energy on calling our attention to the fact that we were created to worship God. In fact, at one point, that David mentioned that let every living thing that has breath praise God, praise ye the Lord. 
So here we are now, oh God, we're here to praise you. We're here to worship you. We're here to remind all of us that you are worthy to be praised. Father, in the process of praising you, we pray that you will be merciful unto us, particularly those that are vulnerable among us because of sickness, because of various issues that we face as a human race. In Jesus' name, amen. First, we want to call upon, or we want to give credit to the Arnaldo Swift and Wellness Center for sponsoring this show this evening. We truly appreciate their sponsorship of this very show this evening. Arnaldo Swift Health and Wellness Center, your one-stop shop for all your health and wellness needs. At Arnaldo Swift Health and Wellness Center, you'll find primary care clinic, frugal health and wellness store. The frugal health and wellness store is a health store with a difference, offering supplements, herbal blends, teas, vitamins, essential oils, vegetarian meatless protein, and wellness classes. Call us. Let us cater for your events. When it is time to take care of your annual or chronic health care needs, visit the clinic or schedule a televisit online or by phone. Call us at 470-880-7700. To make an appointment or visit ornaldoswift.com to book an appointment online. With over 38 years of practice, we specialize in internal medicine, general practice, mental health, wound and ostomy care. Dr. Palmer and his team invites you to visit Ornaldo Swift Health and Wellness Center located at 5386 Snap Finger Woods Drive, Decatur, Georgia. While you're there, visit a natural juice and smoothie bar. Sample our vegan salads and snacks at the in-store deli. You can call in your order at 770-900-2679. Shop in-store or order on DoorDash. Again, we want to thank the Arnaldo Swift Health and Wellness Center for sponsoring this show this evening. And if you have a business and you would like to sponsor a show or a series of shows, uh, please reach out to us so we can discuss the detail and how you can sponsor a show or a series of show. Thank you, and we're looking forward to hearing from you soon. But at this time, just before we hear from our 100 guests at this point, Dr. Lawrence, my friend and my colleague, first we want to hear special music. And then after special music, the next voice that you will hear is Dr. Lawrence.
Clearly, we want to thank the Anthony family for that beautiful selection, reminding us that Jesus is coming soon. We're preaching the gospel, and a part of the gospel, proclamation of the gospel is the reminder that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is coming soon. Now, without any further ado, please help me to welcome our honored guests, my friend, Dr. Lawrence. Welcome, Dr. Lawrence. Looking forward to hearing what you have to share with us today. Thank you, Pastor Bonaby, for the gracious invitation. I thank the uh, wonderful uh, duo, the duet, the, uh, the singers who rendered the special music. I appreciate it. God bless you for your contribution to this ministry. So as you had um, rightly introduced, um, the exposition on the Old Testament as we compare and do a parallel analysis with the book of Revelation. So we're going to continue from where we left off last week. We completed the book of Deuteronomy and so we will continue from there. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your son Jesus Christ. Thank you for the opportunity to study your inspired word. We ask for the aid of the Holy Spirit to be our teacher, be the one to direct us and to rightly divide the word of truth. But we also pray, Father, that you will give us receptive hearts. Bring about conviction and conversion to your word so that we will apply it, live according to the word and that we will be able to have the spiritual vitality, sustenance, and endurance to overcome the enemy. Keep us until the day when Jesus Christ will burst the clouds of heaven to claim us as his own. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. A biblical exposition on the Old Testament and the New Testament books of Revelation. It is important, as I mentioned uh, for, throughout my previous presentations, that the Bible is a complete book from Genesis to Revelation. And when we take the time to examine, to analyze, and to do a comparative analysis of each of the books of the Old Testament, we come to one conclusion, and that is the Bible is truly inspired and it has one author, and that author is God. While at the same time, he designate over 40 different writers, different men and women to compile and put together the, um, his word, to communicate his word to his people. But the overarching author, the one who is orchestrating, who gives all the insights, the one who motivates, the one who directs, is God himself. And we're going to look at what he has done, but through the word, but then I'm going to just by, by way of clarity and emphasis, let me say to our viewers, our listeners, that in case it is the first time you're coming on this platform, because I sent some invitation to a, a few of my friends to, uh, to join in and to listen. Let me say to you that the easiest way to read and understand the book of Revelation is to look at the other books of the Bible to look at how it relates to the other books of the Bible. And by the way, um, there are a lot of people who claim that the book is sealed and that it is incomprehensible. This is far from the truth. So when what we're going to do is we're going to look at the book of Revelation from the beginning all the way going back to the end because you know the the last book in the bible is the book of Re revelation 
but it is important that we understand that as it is the last book, it summarizes all the other books. In fact, you will find segments of each of the Old Testament books, including the New Testament in Revelation. Amazing, astonishing. So while we look at the end of the Bible, the end product of the Bible, the, we, we, we will go, we're going to, what we will do is to parallel and to bring about a comparative analysis between the prologue and the epilogue, the introduction and the conclusion of the Bible. Then we have to follow by comparing chapter with chapter, verse with verse, and word with word. This is very essential. When we do such a uh, compar comparative analysis, we compare, what we do is we compare similar symbolism with those in the same book and with other prof prophetic or prophecy books. We do this method metho methodically chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Very important. Also, we look at names, numbers, words, etc., in each of the chapters of each book. And then we compare them to Revelation. What we, what we will find or what you will find is a harmony, a synchronization, unity, cohesiveness between the book of Revelation and all the other books of the Bible. Now, someone asked me a question some time ago. And the question is, well, suppose Revelation is not the last book in the Bible. Suppose it was just uh, the compilers and the writers who decided to just put Revelation as the conclusive book. I said, well, the internal evidence in the book itself proved that it is. You see, because the ultimate fixer and the ultimate organizer is God. God is the one who organizes, orchestrates, and decides where, when, and how to place his word in a proper chronicle or chronology so that it will make sense to those who read the word of God. It will bring about enlightenment. It will bring about a broad understanding, the scope, the height, the depth, the width of the word will come to clarity. It will come to such a clear, distinct revelation that the one who reads, indeed, the word of the book itself will be fulfilled. Blessed is he who reads and those who understand and those who take to heart the words that are written in this book. So my dear friends, may God continue to guide us as we take the time to study the book of Revelation in conjunction with the other books of the Bible. This is what is known in the circle of um, academia or, or theological academics as intertextual exegesis. Intertextual exegesis or looking at the internal evidence found in each book of the Bible. This is very important. This is a classic way to examine the word of God. And there's going to be only one conclusion when we follow such principle. The conclusion will be that indeed the word of God harmonizes, it is unified, and it is inspired. So we're going to begin with the book of, we're going to continue rather with the book of Joshua. Joshua and the book of Revelation. Last study was uh, Deuteronomy. And then we continue with Joshua. Joshua and Revelation. And one would imagine, how could the book of Joshua relate? <laughs> how could it harmonize with Revelation? What are the similarities between Joshua and Revelation? Well, the answer to this is found in the internal evidence. When we do intertextual exegesis, we compare verse with verse, word with word, uh, symbolism with symbolism, 
and we looked at them, we could see clearly that there is something that is truly inspiring about the word of God. And what that does essentially is that it builds faith in the word of God. To those who are skeptical, to those who are doubting, to those who are disconcerted with the way uh, men have misrepresented God through his word or have uh, preached heresy, things that are totally uncharacteristic of God. And as a result of the way we find scrupulous, or should I say unscrupulous, uh, preachers and disingenuous pastors who have misrepresented God by using his word for the wrong reason. For those who have been uh, disenchanted and who have lost faith, I want you to know that this exercise will help you to reignite your faith in God and to go back to his word and to earnestly and sincerely apply the word of God to your life. So Joshua chapter four, very, uh, very interesting. Chapter four, verses one through 11. What we find there is that when the children of Israel were about to cross into the promised land, they're about to cross the river Jordan, God under the leadership of Joshua, gave specific instructions that they should take stones. Stones and use it as a monument. 24 stones were to be taken from the riverbed of Jordan. 24 stones. And those stones were to be used as a memorial. You know, stones are very foundational. Stones are very important in terms of structure, durability, in terms of steadiness. And, um, and, and also it speaks of covenant agreements and promises. People use stones as boundaries during the Old Testament times. So God gave Joshua specific instructions to carry those stones with them into Israel. And then when we read Revelation chapter four, Revelation chapter four, verse four, there we see that there are 24 seats, 24 seats designated as the foundation upon which the 24 elders occupy their position in the presence of God. Now, when we look at the, the language, we are looking and making comparison with the symbols. The 24 stones and the 24 seats has something in common. Because without the stone foundation, the 24, which represents uh, in the Old Testament, the 12 tribes, and then in the New Testament, we see the 12 disciples. It is important that we understand that God uses the stone, he used the stone in the Old Testament to prefigure as a type of what is to be in the New Testament. And then when we look at Revelation, we are seeing the symbolic similarity, the language of the 24 coming to bear, that tells us that there is a symmetry, there is a uniqueness, there is a collaboration, there is a, a, a unity of purpose that God is conveying a special message to us through symbolism, through types and antitypes. When we go to chapter five, chapter five of Joshua, chapter five, particularly verse 12, and you have your Bible with you, you could follow in Joshua chapter 5, verse 12, we also find that the manna, the manna, the bread that came from heaven that God gave the children of Israel 
By the way, they ate of that bread, the manna, for 40 years. 40 years. But as soon as they entered the promised land and they start eating of the corn of the land of Canaan, then the bread from heaven ceased to fall. Ceased. God ceased to provide for them because then that they were in the position of providing for themselves because they had their own land. The land of promise became theirs. They had their own land. And because they had their own land, the land of Canaan was subdivided among the 12 tribes. And as a result, each tribe had a portion of the land. Joshua was not only a commander, but he was also a surveyor. He surveyed the land. He was one of the 12 spies, by the way, that was sent by Moses to spy the land. So he scout and he went through all the length and breadth of the land of Canaan. And he brought back to Moses a good report. And as a result of his knowledge of the land of Canaan, he was in the position to subdivide, to measure, and to survey the land and to give it according to each tribe what that which God had designated. So they had the land in their possession now. As a result, the Bible says, when they started eating of the corn that was grown in Canaan, then the manna, the bread from heaven ceased to fall. So now we look at Revelation. Where do we find manna in Revelation? In chapter two, verse 17 of Revelation. Very interesting. In chapter two, of Revelation, verse 17, God says to, the, to modern spiritual Israel, God says to us, if we are obedient, if you, we are obedient, we shall eat of the hidden manna. So there is the language symbolism. There is the parallel. God's promise, my dear friends, has not changed because his character is unchangeable. And so therefore, he keeps his promise. Guess which promise God keeps? The promise that he had made with Abraham. And that God, by virtue of his unchangeableness, we as believers can rest assured, we can depend upon the word of God, the Bible, the ins written inscriptions and directions given by inspiration to the prophets, we could rest assured that whatever promise God has made in the Bible, it will be fulfilled. It will come to pass. Powerful stuff. Now let's go, let's continue. In chapter 6, verse 7 of the book of Joshua. Chapter 6, verse 7. Interestingly, when they entered the land of Canaan, uh, they faced the obstacle of the city of Jericho. Why Jericho was an obstacle? Because the dwellers and the residents of the city of Jericho, they defied the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they vowed, they vowed to fight against the Israelites and to push them back where they came from. Now that does ring a bell as to what's going on today in modern Israel. But however, that's for another day, another time, another subject. But the significant lesson in chapter six of the book of Joshua is that the specific direction God gave them that God told Joshua seven priests had to be selected with seven trumpets. And those priests had to match ahead before at the, at the front of the army of Israel. By the way, they had no weaponry. God told them, no, have the priest, seven priests in front of the army, an army without sword, without spears, without shield. And God told them to match around, match around the city of Jericho once a day. And on the seventh day, on the seventh day, they had to match seven times.
And at the end of the seventh round, the seven priests will sound or blow the seven trumpets. And when that happened, when the seven trumpets were sounded by the seven priests, the walls of Jericho came down. The walls of Jericho came down. The city was captured without the children of Israel lifting a sword. God fought for them in a miraculous way, just the same as he had done previously on previous encounters, beginning with the Egyptians in Egypt when they crossed the Red Sea. And then throughout their journey, God continued to manifest his power on their behalf because God had promised them that he will protect them. And today, my friends, if we put our trust in God and we allow God to fight our own battles, he will win the battle for us. By the way, God has never lost a battle, never has, never will. So who is fighting your battles today for you? Are you fighting on your own? Have you, you really considered the amount of times that you've lost so many bouts? Well, it is time to take a serious uh, introspection, a serious look at the way you have been fighting your battles. You see, the Bible says that we wrestle not, the Apostle Paul that is, says we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, our, our warfare is not carnal. It is not, it, it, our warfare is not natural. It is not a, a, a fleshly war. It is a, a spiritual warfare. It is a spiritual warfare. Therefore, we need to have a spiritual armor. And by virtue of having a spiritual armor mean that we have to depend on God to fight the battles for us. Having said this, let us turn to Revelation. When we turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 8, verses 1 through 6, interestingly, what we find there is amazing. That in chapter 8, verses 1 through 6, we see that as, the, as a spiritual Israel as God's spiritual church and people embarked upon the, against the forces of evil when the world will begin to wage war against God's people, which has already begun, by the way. There is the symbolic blowing of trumpets. Seven trumpets are mentioned. <laughs> seven trumpets, just like the seven trumpets were mentioned in the book of Joshua. Who is standing in opposition to God's people right now? The world. The world. So in a symbolic way, Jericho, Jericho is a type of the world. The people of the world, they have turned their backs on God and the majority do not listen to the Bible, to the word of God. And so as a result, the blowing of seven trumpets will announce the destruction of the world. Just as the blowing of the seven trumpets in the book of Joshua announced the destruction of Jericho, the destruction of this world is imminent, my friends. How do we know it's going to happen? Because what has already been fulfilled in the past is evidence and proof that it will happen again. So now we have it, but there's more. The seven priests are mentioned in chapter six, verse 13. In Revelation, we find the parallel Seven priests, chapter eight, verses one through seven. Everything, you know, to precision, it is amazing. 
What is the purpose behind this juxtaposition? What is the purpose behind this parallelism? What is the purpose behind comparing text with text, scripture with scripture, symbol with symbol? What is the purpose? The purpose is, my friend, it is this. God is showing us how uniquely inspired the Bible is. Most importantly, to invoke in us faith, to trust, and to believe in the word of God. There was a time many years ago before my conversion, I was a doubter. I used to doubt the word of God. But I need to testify and to admit to you that this time has long gone. It has been evaporated. Why? Because the word of God has substantiated itself. It has proven itself. It is its own best interpreter. So when you read a statement in Revelation that doesn't seem to make sense to you, the best way to understand it is to compare it to the other books in the Bible. And when you compare it to the other books of the Bible, everything comes to light. Clear as crystal. So my friends, we're going to turn to the book of Judges. I don't know if I have time, extra time, but let's try this evening because there's so much material to cover, so much to digest, so much to unravel. So hang on with me. We'll try to see if we could cover the book of Judges compared to the book of Revelation. Judges, Revelation. Where do we begin? We begin at chapter four. Chapter four seems to re-echo, re-echo seven trumpets of victory. We find it in Judges chapter four, verse seven. Remember, this is Judges. This is not Joshua. This is Judges. Seven trumpets of victory is mentioned in verse 27 of chapter four. And then we find... In chapter 5, verse 10, God says he shall sit in judgment. In chapter 5, verse 10. In chapter 20, we find all the tribes of, the, of Israel is numerated and mentioned in chapter 20 of the book of Judges. And then we find in chapter 5, verse 3, a statement is made. O ye kings, O ye princes, I will sing praises unto the Lord. A song, a song, a, a, a temple song was inaugurated and the singing of the song, rather, should I say, the lyrics of the song is one that is truly eye-opening. And we're going to see how this plays out in Revelation in a while. Also in chapter 20, verse 38, there is mentioned the, illu the illusion of flame with smoke rise out of the city. There was a pronouncement made that was based upon the con conditionality that if the residents of the city did not repent, then that city will be burned down and the smoke will rise. God made that prediction in Judges. In chapter, five, chapter 3 and verse 4, and uh, God says, hearkened unto the commandments of God. You see, the commandments of God was contingent upon the judgment to follow. If they obey the commandment, then the judgment will not fall on them or it will not uh, follow them. But the disobedience, the, the annulment and the breaking of the Ten Commandments or the law of God was a sign that judgment will follow if they don't respect or obey the commandments of God. So let's go now to Revelation. Let us go now to Revelation and look at chapter 11 of Revelation verse 15. Now we see uh, the language motif. We see the similarity. We see the comparative analysis, intertextual exegetical analysis, the similarity, the sameness, the unity of the word of God in Revelation speaks to like. Judges is having a conversation, as it were, with John in Revelation. They had lived uh, almost 2,000 years apart, but yet still, it sounds as though the two prophets 
were having a conversation at the same time. Amazing. It shows us, my dear beloved brothers and sisters, how uniquely inspired the word of God is. Each book of the Bible unlocks Revelation. And Revelation complements the other books of the Bible. Trumpets of victory. God has promised victory to his people. Now, you will not doubt that uh, how the children of Israel gain victory over Jericho. Oh, yes, you know the ruins, the archaeological finds of the ruined city of Jerusalem speak eloquently to the fulfillment of the word of God. We have proof. We have the evidence because the ruins of Jericho is there to reveal that the children of Israel without, without raising a sword or a spear conquered Jericho. Jericho was defeated. And as a result, the world will be defeated. The trumpet, what is the symbolic meaning of the trumpet? The blowing of the trumpet. That will be another study. I have another compilation that I have uh, on the blowing of the trumpets, but it symbolically represents the announcing, the announcing of the judgment, the coming judgment of God. The preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the gospel in a symbolic way announces the coming judgment. The, we are literally, what I'm doing right now is I'm literally blowing the gospel trumpet. Those who take heed will be saved and those who do not will be destroyed by the coming judgment. I need to let you know that not all of the residents of Jericho perish. No, 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 not all perish. There were some people that were saved from the city of Jericho. It is absolutely clear who they were. Their names are mentioned. Have you heard of Rahab? Rahab and her household, her entire family, their lives were spared. Interestingly, we find that her vocation, her or her occupation was not one that was quite color, um, attractive, but very colorful. Um, she, had, she was a lady of unsavory, uh, unsavory uh, should I say, occupation. She was a harlot. That's what she did for a living. But yet still, in spite of her moral impropriety, in spite of her uh, uh, disgraceful occupation, she found grace in the eyes of the Lord. She was saved. Why? Because she believed in the God of the Israelites. When she heard how God opened the Red Sea and how God blessed them with raining manna from heaven, bread from heaven for 40 long years. God provided them with water in the wilderness. God took care of them during the day with cool shade of the cloud by day that kept them cool from the burning sweltering heat of the desert. And then in the night, the same cloud that kept them cool turned into a pillar of fire and provided warmth because the temperature drops at night and gets extremely cold. So God preserved and protected them from the frost by night. What a God, what an amazing God. So Rahab heard of the news and she says she is no longer going to hold on to heresy false teachings. She no longer going to doubt the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She renounced her profession, her vocation as a prostitute. She gave that up and 
she also discarded all false worship, including idolatry. She took a stand with God and his people. And as a result, there was an agreement made between her and the 12 spies. And they told her, because you have given us safety and protection in your home, and you confess your faith in God because while they were there in Rahab's home, protected by her, they gave her a Bible study, of course. You see, when people have been good to us, we must also take that opportunity to give them a crash course on the word of God, on salvation, on truth, mercy, justice. That's what they did. And the woman got converted. She accepted the gospel and they told her, well, what you have to do is to put a red cord in your window, hang it from your window so that when we march around Jericho and the walls would come tumbling down, you will be spared. Your life will be spared. You will be saved and protected and delivered. And she did it. She was obedient, obeyed the commandments of God. That red cord hanging from her window represents the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sins of the world. That red cord that hung from Rahab's window was a symbol of the blood of Jesus. You remember when the children of Israel were moving out of Egypt? God gave them specific instructions that they should put the blood of the slain lamb on the doorpost, the windows, and those who were in-house when the angel of death came, saw the blood, they were spared. The Passover was initiated. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Amazing. Rahab's life was spared because symbolically she put the red scarlet cord hanging from her window. She demonstrated faith in the living God. Today, as the gospel of Jesus Christ is being proclaimed, being preached, being promulgated, we are preaching the blood of Jesus Christ, the lamb that was slain, Jesus Christ, the one who died on the cross. When we confess Jesus Christ and we embrace and accept the preaching of the gospel through the sounding of the trumpet, we will be victorious. Our lives will be spared from the coming doom, from the coming judgment, from the coming visitation of divine judgment. The book of Revelation truly summarizes the judgment. In chapter 20, verse 4, talk about he that sat on the judgment seat of God and that all of us, chapter 22, verse 4, says we all must appear before the judgment seat of God to give an account of everything that we have done under the sun. My dear friends, it is paramount. It is it is of paramount importance that we take heed to the word of God because Revelation is speaking to us today. In chapter 7 verse 4, just as the 12 tribes are mentioned in chapter 20 of the book of Judges, in chapter 7 verse 4, the 12 tribes of Israel are also mentioned. Balancing, creating a balance act through divine revelation. Jack supposing and putting in front of us the unity, the cohesiveness of scripture. Man, that tells us that the Bible is truly inspired. Which book on earth you could find such parallelism that spans over thousands of years? None except the Bible, the word of God. In chapter 15, verse 3 of Revelation, says the children of God, they will sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. And they will say, oh God, the same, the lyrics, remember I mentioned about the lyrics, oh ye king, oh ye princes, I will sing praises unto the Lord. There we see those who will be victorious at the end of the age. Revelation 15, they will sing. <laughs> Hallelujah to God. 
And then in chapter 18, verse 18, the uh, revelation says in chapter 18, verse 18, that the smoke of her burning, that is the wicked city, symbolically represents the disobedient, disloyal uh, people of the earth. They will be burned and their ashes will go up in smoke. And the same language, the, the smoke, the flame with smoke motif and coming out of the city is reminiscent and it is given in a parallel form in Revelation chapter 18, verse 18. And then in chapter 14, verse 12, they that keep the commandments of God. Hallelujah. And then we find in chapter 3, verse 4 of Judges, my friends. Chapter 3, verse 4 of Judges. When God says specifically, hearkened unto the commandments of the Lord. Chapter 14, verse 12 gives the announcement. Here are the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the command. Well, the dragon was wrought with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed that keeps the commandments of God, that keeps the commandments of the remnant of her seed. So you see the same church, the same people of God that started the journey from the stock of Abraham, continued through all the wilderness experience and through exile and through all the different epochs and the different dispensations. Today, the remnant the remnant of that same movement, that same congregation, that same church is going to be seen as keeping the commandments of God. So in these last days, the, the, the attention, the direction, or should I say the redirection of us as a people of God is to go back to our roots what is our root? The keeping of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Remember, by faith, it was faith that led them through the Red Sea, faith that led them through the wilderness experience, faith that led them to conquer Canaan and to reside, to become sedentary throughout the Canaan land, the distribution of the land. Remember, we are not going to inherit an earthly Canaan, but we will inherit a heavenly Canaan. And that is the place where truly there will be no more war, no more tribulation, no more attacks from the enemy. But God's people will be victorious eternally. I am looking for that day. How about you, my friends? It's going to be a glorious event. It is my prayer today that as a result of this presentation, that your faith in the word of God will be reignited. It will be deepened, broadened. It will be strengthened. And that your spiritual appetite will, you, you, you will have a desire to eat more from the buffet of the word of God. May God bless you. May God keep you. May he strengthen you until next study, my friends. So now I'm going to turn over to Pastor Bonaby, and I know you have some questions you would like to ask. So anyone with any question, uh, how the message has impressed your heart and has brought meaning to you, let us hear from you now. I think that's a great question. It's a great way to lead this conversation, Pastor. Uh, perhaps if someone in the audience um, have a statement or a question and how the word so far has touched his or her heart. Hello, my name is Pastor Owen Bonaby, President of Final Shout 
television and social media network. Fanon shouts, objective is to join hands and hearts with our fellow men, holy angels, and God himself in sharing God's redemptive love with the entire world. That Jesus is the creator of the world, the sustainer of the world, the redeemer of the world, and that Jesus has promised us he will come back to receive us unto himself. Please join our mission in reaching two billion people with God's redemptive love in three ways, with your time, your giftedness, and your resource. First, with your time. Watch and share Final Shout 24-7 anywhere in the world on the following platforms. Final Shout on Ruka TV. Final Shout on Fire TV. Final Shout TV on Apple TV. Social media such as Facebook or Meta. YouTube, Twitter, download or Android and Apple phone apps. Or you can watch us 24-7 on our website. Watch.fanashout.org Second, with your giftedness. Become Fana Shout's show producer, director, contributor, host, hostess, or you can tell us of your giftedness and how you would like to serve. Third, with your resource. Support Final Shout financially. Become Final Shout's 12 Stars Club member, which help with our monthly operations budget. Two, become a sponsor of a show or sponsor a series of shows. Both individuals and businesses can be sponsors. And three, choose our merchandise. Thank you in advance for your prayerful consideration in joining our mission in reaching two billion people with God's redemptive love. As the joy of the Lord is final shouts strength.